London, the epicenter of British culture and identity, Tower Bridge, red telephone boxes, and stone-faced royal guards wearing the iconic bearskins over their heads have all become closely associated with what it means to be British. There was no time in history when this was less true than during the mid-1990s. Hot new bands like the Spice Girls took the world by storm and London quickly became the coolest, trendiest city on the entire planet. British culture dominated global media, or so we've been told. Was this period all it's cracked up to be? Or was it all a ploy to distract from the crises plaguing the UK at the time? Stick around until the end to find out how the Cool Britannia period might have even laid the foundations for Brexit. You are watching I Explained. Let's get started. Let's take a minute to set the scene. Throughout most of the second half of the 20th century, the world had been engulfed in the Cold War. The capitalist powers of the West vied for cultural influence with the communist force of the USSR. This conflict permeated throughout society, and the threat of mutual nuclear annihilation loomed over everyone's heads. In 1991, the USSR collapsed, and the Cold War at last came to an end. While civil war and economic ruin fell upon the former Soviet bloc, a widespread feeling of relief and hope washed over the Western world. The future looked promising. Nuclear war had been avoided, the values of liberalism had triumphed, and the world seemed to be in the palm of everyone's hands. In the following, Francis Fukuyama published the book The End of History and The Last Man, which claimed that Western liberalism and democracy had finally triumphed and that the rest of the world would soon adopt the victorious ideology. While Fukuyama has received more than a fair share of criticism for this prediction, the book outlines how optimistic the Western world felt in the early 1990s. Western culture exploded in relevance after the fall of the USSR. Though the trademark blue jeans and fast food joints of American culture were the most widespread, the United Kingdom was also home to significant cultural icons of the Western world. Pink Floyd, Queen, the Beatles and the Smiths were just a few of the world-famous British bands that stirred the hearts of music lovers across the planet. In the heat of this continent-wide optimistic delirium, British culture underwent a significant upheaval. Suddenly it felt great to be patriotic. British culture was simply all the rage. Britpop dominated the scene and London quickly became the heart of this new movement. Gastropubs, the Spice Girls, Oasis, artists like Damien Hirst, and trendy new clubs popping up in the vibrant multicultural city center. All of these were factors of this new wave of cool Britannia. London was gripped by an unconditional love for all things British. Union Jacks plastered every corner of the city, from the walls to women's dresses. It truly was the place to be, and nothing sums up this feeling better than the 1997 cover of Vanity Fair magazine. This one, Liam Gallagher, an iconic British singer, posed next to a half-naked Patsy Kensit, the lead singer of Eighth Wonder, in bed. Union Jacks cover the sheets and pillows. London Swings Again is written in bold letters across the front of the magazine, hearkening back to the years of the swinging 60s. Safe to say, London is riding a wave of renewed British patriotism and pride, but this isn't the case all across the UK. Some parts of the country are caught beneath the water's surface, thrashing for air. By the time the mid-1990s rolled around, the UK had already gone through a number of social upheavals. Economically, the country came out of a nasty recession. People flocked to the shops to spend their newfound cash and were excited at the prospect of finally seeing some growth. Politically, the new Labour government was desperate to rebrand their party and nation as hip, cool and energetic. Gone were the dull old days of Labour strongholds in the working-class North. Now was the time to harness the energy of that metropolitan bubble. With the young, energetic Tony Blair at the helm, the UK looked invincible, but not everybody was cheering. Despite what many might believe, London doesn't make up the entirety of the United Kingdom, and many were looking in from the outside. They didn't like what they saw. They believed an arrogant middle class was building in the city, which looked down on the rest of the country and kept the attention firmly on itself. No amount of Spice Girls performances and Union Jack miniskirts could stop that. Not all of the criticism aimed at this middle-class bubble even came from outside London. 
Though the trendy nightclubs and flash new gastropubs were bouncing, many of the city's 32 boroughs were home to families who were struggling to make ends meet. One-bedroom flats used to house families of seven were not an uncommon sight, and many felt they were being left behind as London took off to global significance. Unfortunately, little attention was given to those caught in financial vortexes. The leadership and the press wanted to focus on how London had been transformed from a drab, dreary capital with lousy weather and allegedly horrible food into the coolest city on the planet. The shocking art pieces of Damien Hirst, hot new albums from the most popular bands, the latest fashions draped over the city's most talented models, and the revival of British cinema with hit pieces like Four Weddings and a Funeral were all too eye-catching for people to focus on the UK's other problems. But everything that comes up must come down. Fads eventually fade, and what was once considered cool becomes old and passé. As quickly as London had risen to global relevance, it then fell into cultural obscurity. By the start of the new millennium, the world no longer appeared interested in the UK's antics and decided to look elsewhere. But while the rest of the world moved on, the UK had to wake up from this period of wild optimism to a nasty hangover. The economic problems and disparities that the Cool Britannia movement in London had been masking came back to bite. Many were angry and believed the whole ordeal was nothing more than a superficial PR spin to cover up for the sorry state of the UK at the time. The United Kingdom's relationship with the EU has always been unique. While the European project sought to bring the continent together through closer integration, the UK has always been hesitant about the idea of yielding too much national sovereignty to a central European government. Yet the UK still wanted the economic benefits of EU membership, particularly the unfettered access to the single market. The name Europe a la carte was coined, as the UK had opted out of a number of agreements by the turn of the millennium, the Euro and Schengen area being the most notable examples. In 2008, the Great Recession hit the United States. The aftermath quickly spread across the globe, and soon enough, the UK was caught in the middle of another turbulent economic downturn. In 2012, the Conservative Party took the reins, headed by David Cameron, with the mission of saving the British economy through austerity policies. That is to say, dramatically reducing government spending. The worst hit by the recession and the government's austerity measures were the working class families. This left a sour taste in their mouths. They already felt the country had been split in two during the 1990s, but now they were being left behind while the bustling economic center filled with wealthy middle-class elites, London was recovering. The days of Cool Britannia and Britpop were long gone, but the aftermath effects of that era were still being felt many years later. The UK Independence Party, also known as UKIP, had been campaigning for the United Kingdom to leave the EU since its founding in 1993. Though the idea of leaving the EU had always been relevant in British politics, it hadn't gained any serious traction. This environment was the perfect opportunity for those seeking to pull the UK out of the European Union. They were dubbed Brexiteers. They pointed blame at the EU for the economic woes those same working class families were going through and highlighted how the country had supposedly economically benefited from membership, yet those left behind during the Great Recession had only suffered. This galvanized a popular base in the UK and the cries for Brexit became louder and louder. Many saw the metropolitan elite of London as the only ones who profited from the decrees of Brussels and demanded a referendum on the UK's membership of the EU. When the Conservative Party won the elections in 2016, they promised to deliver it. London, once the most incredible city on the planet, remained favourable to EU membership as a whole, as did Scotland and Northern Ireland. But the rest of the UK voted in favour of Brexit. As a result, the country would become engulfed in a political affair that still dominates the news to this very day. Did the rise of British culture during the Cool Britannia period solely cause Brexit? Of course not. It's undeniable, however, that the divide between the metropolitan London middle class and the rest of the country deepened as a result of the fad. So, no. The Spice Girls didn't cause Brexit, but they might have helped bring it about. What do you think? Was Cool Britannia a great display of national pride and a sorely needed cultural revival? 
Or was it just a superficial PR move that ultimately only helped split the UK further apart? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button and subscribe for more content like this in the future. Until next time.